time, which is something I still very strongly believe. With, without you, without investigation, we're not going to make it through this century. Now, it's been, it's been my assignment to talk about the past and the future and what we might learn from the past of journalism that will help us into the future. You'll have to forgive me, I'm a historian, and so there's a danger that I might speak of the past beyond the 21st century. I might even go into areas that none of us even remember. In fact, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. What I'm gonna do is start by talking about an event which was central to the formation of the world that we live in, but was not covered by journalists at the time. I have in mind the famine in Soviet Ukraine in 1932 and 1933. And what I'd like to do from there is try to draw three lessons from that moment that might help us to understand what I think is a very big story, perhaps the biggest story that's unfolding this year and into next year, which is sadly the famine and the hunger which is likely to result from the Russo-Ukrainian war, which is taking place right now. So let me start with the past. In 1932 and 1933, roughly four million citizens of the Soviet Union died on the territory of Ukraine. All of this death was unnecessary. It was a result of policy choices that were taken at the top. The Soviet Union had been around for about 15 years. At this point, Joseph Stalin was the person who was making the decisions. He was carrying out a policy which he himself referred to as a kind of self-colonization or internal colonization. The notion was that part of the Soviet Union would exploit another part of the Soviet Union. Stalin was undertaking this transformation of the Soviet Union which involved the state taking control of agriculture. This policy generally failed, people were going hungry, and Stalin took a particular political decision to blame the Ukrainians. In the summer and fall of 1932, he took political decisions, which meant that these four million people who didn't have to die, did die in late 1932 and early 1933 to recover. Its basic outlines are essentially known. It's something, though, which had we known about it at the time, had it been covered, we might have understood a whole century differently. The way we understand the Soviet Union would probably be different. The Chinese Revolution might not have taken place. Russians would probably understand themselves differently, and so on. But the reason why this event is so important for me now, and the reason why I'm speaking it to you about it, is that I think there are some basic lessons we can learn from it that might affect how we cover the unfolding hunger disaster, which I'm afraid is going to take place in the coming weeks and months. So the first is, back then, people had trouble with the narrative. The dominant story was, Stalin is rational. This plan makes sense. It was very difficult for people to, to get the idea that perhaps a turn had been taken towards tyranny, towards fiction, towards ideology. The second big problem was the simple absence of reporters. It was very hard to cover the Soviet Union in the early 1930s. And beyond that, it was illegal for reporters to go to Soviet Ukraine in 1932 and 1933. So to my knowledge, and perhaps somebody can correct me, but to my knowledge, there was only one reporter who wrote about the famine in Soviet Ukraine under his own byline, and that was a, a Welshman called Gareth Jones. Only one reporter, although of course, as all of you reporters know, the difference between one and zero here is, is very significant. But it was very, very hard to actually publish about this had to do with the propaganda around it, in particular with a kind of victim blaming or reversal of victimhood. The Soviet propaganda around this famine blamed the victims. It blamed the Ukrainians themselves. And then when people from beyond the Soviet Union tried to draw attention to the famine, Soviet propaganda referred to them as Nazis. So this combination of blaming the victim and referring to journalists and others beyond the Soviet Union as Nazis had a chilling effect, which deterred people from paying too much attention 
to the story. Now, this is important to me fundamentally because it connects to bigger, broader issues, more familiar issues of world history. That famine is a political history, obviously not just in Ukraine, but in India and Africa and around the world. The famine that took place in Soviet Ukraine in 1932 and 1933 was a colonial famine. It was an attempt by a center to exploit a periphery. And, in, and I'm going to mention this because we're in Germany. It was also very important as an inspiration to Adolf Hitler. The main reason why Adolf Hitler fought, planned and fought the Second World War was to conquer Ukraine. The main goal in that war was to control the fertile agricultural territory of Ukraine. And the reason why Hitler thought something like this could be done is that he thought Stalin was doing this. Seeing this global history that, so to speak, went missing, how can that help us now? How can that help us in 2022 and 2023? As I see it, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it, a similar story is unfolding before our eyes. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Russia is carrying out a war of destruction in Ukraine. That means the deportation of quite literally millions of Ukrainians. It means the destruction of Ukrainian cities. It means the execution of civic leaders in Ukraine. But it also means the attempt to destroy the Ukrainian economy. And the Ukrainian economy now, as historically, is based upon agriculture and the export of agricultural goods. So part of the effort to destroy Ukraine involves a blockade of Ukrainian trade. It involves the destruction and the theft of Ukrainian agriculture, but also in particular a blockade by the Russian Navy, which is presenting, preventing Ukrainian foodstuffs from going out into the rest of the world. You can all anticipate the consequences of this. In general, prices of agricultural goods will go up, which means that vulnerable populations, for example, in the Horn of Africa, are going to have great problems. China will be hoarding agricultural goods, which will make it harder for others to have access. And then particular countries, for example, in North Africa, which are dependent upon Ukrainian grain, are going to suffer. As with Stalin, so with Putin, this is a political decision where the consequences are perfectly predictable. If Ukraine is blockaded, it is known that the world will starve. That can be known in advance, and that is what is unfolding now. What I'd like to suggest is that those three lessons from the past can help us think about how we might cover these events as they move forward. Number one, the story. We have generally wanted to think that the Russian state is rational, that Putin is a kind of technocrat, and for that reason, some of us had trouble anticipating that he could actually invade Ukraine. I think for the same reasons, some of us have trouble imagining that there could be a deeper, darker version of this war. But there is. The deeper, darker version is the version where starvation takes place. Presence of reporters. Now, of course, this time around, unlike in 1932 and 1933, there are plenty of reporters in Ukraine itself. We've heard from some outstanding ones these last couple of days. There's no shortage of reporters in Ukraine. There is, however, a shortage of reporters in Moscow, um, for obvious reasons. But for me, the most interesting absence is the lack of reporters from the global south in Ukraine. Now, that may seem like a strange thought. Why should there be reporters from the Global South in Ukraine? I'm perfectly aware that reporters from the Global South have plenty of other things to think about and to write about aside from Ukraine. But it does seem to me that the story which is unfolding in these next weeks and months has to do with both Ukraine and the Global South, has to do with both Ukraine and Africa, and that reporters from those two places are going to have to go back and forth in order to make that story happen. The third issue which is common to the two events is the victim reversal. So one of the reasons why we know that what's happening is going to be rather bad is that the propaganda has already begun. Russian propaganda is already blaming the Ukrainians. The cause, of course, of the hunger is very simple. It's the Russian boats in the Black Sea. It's as simple as that. But Russian propaganda is already trying to blame the Ukrainians. And you will all, as you will all know, there's also the use of the word Nazi which has the intended effect of chilling reporters, preventing reporters from writing clearly about what is going on. So 
Where does that leave us? Well, let me make a point about global history and then make a couple of recommendations. As with the 1930s, so the story that we're seeing now is a global history involving colonialism. For 500 years, Europeans, in, in attempting to conquer the rest of the world, made colonial arguments. They said, these people are not a nation, or this political organization is not a state. By no coincidence, this is the same set of arguments that Russia has made with respect to Ukraine. In that sense, the Russian war in Ukraine is a continuation of a specific European tradition of colonial wars. But sadly, there's another colonial layer underneath that. In this particular set of events, where Russia is blockading Ukraine and preventing Ukrainian foodstuffs from being exported around the world, there is also the idea that people in Africa and people in Asia don't matter. People in Africa and people in Asia are just there to starve so that we can blame the Ukrainians. And here we have the idea of objectification, which is very important in the history of colonialism. Franz Fanon, who's a very important thinker for me too, makes the argument that the colonizer sees the colonized as an object, right? The colonizer doesn't see the colonized as a person, but as a means to an end. And I'm afraid that what we're seeing now, as this hunger plan unfolds, is a kind of double objectification, where the Ukrainians are not seen as a people, but also the others around the world, Asians and Africans chiefly, who are going to be starved by this war, are not seen as people. They're seen as objects in a kind of propaganda campaign. So what can we recommend? Well, a few very simple things, and then I'll be looking forward to, to the discussion. The first thing is, we have to be courageous enough to tell a different story. We have to be courageous enough not just to contest the propaganda and say that maybe it's not true, but to have our own concepts. Like, for example, the concept of a hunger plan. Since it is known by everyone that blockading Ukrainian ports will lead to world starvation, I think it's reasonable to think of a plan. That's one concept. There could, there could certainly be others. A second thing which is very important is the simple physical presence of reporters. We've talked a lot about platforms. I'm not gonna debate their significance or their value, but nothing substitutes for the actual physical presence of a reporter on the site where the story is taking place. And what I'm gonna suggest here, perhaps a little bit unorthodoxly, is that it seems important that reporters from the Global South are in Kiev. I know some are, but it seems like it'd be important, given what's about to happen, that many more reporters be in Kiev now, and that someone take the effort to, to organize something like this. The third thing is the victimization, or the, the, the victimhood reversal. I think it's very important that in, in telling this story, in looking at this story, we make sure that everybody is given their own agency. It's very important to see the Ukrainians as agents. It's very important to see the Africans and the Asians as agents. It's very important to see all of the pieces of the story as they hang together. This is not just a matter of great powers. It's not just a matter of Russia. It's a matter of, it's a matter of the entire world. So rather than letting Moscow tell the story of how it's the Ukrainians' fault or how they're all Nazis or whatever it might be, rather than just responding to the propaganda, it's very important to make sure that everyone has a voice. This is a story, I think, that can only be told from the Horn of Africa and from North Africa and from Ukraine all at the same time. So the, the risk that you ran when you asked a historian um, was that a historian would use specific examples. I've used specific examples. I've tried to show how a story that we didn't know anything about at the time might help us to cover a story which is now unfolding. And that leads me to my last point, which is a general one. I realize that this is all about the future. I realize that you're all young and beautiful. Um, however, I, there's something in me which is deeply suspicious of this idea of making the future right now. <laughs> what are we making the future out of? What is the larger context you write your stories within? To me, it's history. The thing that I'm trying to explain to you, that there's going to be, oh, that there's going to be a worldwide famine because of this war, it might seem strange if we just look at the present. But if we know some basic things about Ukrainian history, then it won't seem so strange. 
If we know that for literally thousands of years, Ukraine has fed larger parts of the world, it won't seem so strange. If we know that Ukraine fed ancient Athens, which to many people is an important reference, if we know that during the age of discovery, the European colonial powers imported grain from Ukraine, bringing about serfdom in Ukraine, if we know that both Hitler and Stalin regarded Ukraine as the colonial territory, which would allow them to change the world, if we know all of those things in the background, then the possibility of a really grand story, grand in the sense of terrible, then that possibility might make more sense to us. So in order to get stories about the future right, I think in order to get any kind of perspective on the future, it also helps to have some history. That's my final point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for